Good afternoon, and thank you for attending today's webinar. My name is Jennifer Cooley, and I am the Education and Outreach Manager for the State Historical Museum. During 2021, the State Historical Society is commemorating the 175th anniversary of Iowa's statehood. The Iowa History 101 webinars on the second and fourth Thursdays will continue throughout the year. You can learn more about this series and all of our programs that commemorate Iowa's 175th anniversary on our website at iowaculture.gov. Please remember to sign up for each webinar you would like to attend, and don't worry if you can't watch live, all presentations will be recorded. Today we will learn about the Native nations and people who inhabited the land that would become Iowa. We acknowledge the Indigenous peoples that have called Iowa home since time immemorial, as well as the more than 17,000 Native people who live in Iowa today. We acknowledge that the land now known as the state of Iowa was the ancestral home of the Iowa nation and our state is named in recognition of them. Iowa was also an ancestral home at times for the Oto Missouri, Meskwaki, Sauk, Dakota, Ho-Chunk, Omaha Ponca, and the Potawatomi, as well as other tribes that passed through at various times. The language used to identify many of our lakes, rivers, cities, counties, schools, buildings, and sites reflect the inherent imprint of indigenous peoples. We offer our respect to their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations, and acknowledge the indigenous peoples who have made essential contributions to the landscape of Iowa, including traditional knowledge, experience, labor, technology, science, philosophy, and the arts. A few housekeeping points before I introduce our speaker. Everyone came into this webinar on mute with cameras off. Closed captions are now available by clicking the closed caption button on your screen. The webinar is being recorded and will be placed on the Iowa Culture page of YouTube in a few days. I have disabled the chat function, but if you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A feature throughout the webinar. My colleague, Matt Beyer, is watching that feature and will prepare a list of questions for the speaker at the end of the presentation. But please note, we may not be able to get to all of the questions. And now I'm happy to introduce our speaker, Lance Foster. Lance is the author of Indians of Iowa from the University of Iowa Press and he will be reading from that book today. He received a BA in Anthropology and Native American Studies from the University of Montana, as well as an MA in Anthropology and an MLA in Landscape Architecture from Iowa State University. He is an alumnus from the Institute of American Indian Arts. He has been the director um, in the Native Rights, Land and Culture Division for the Office of Hawaiian Affairs a historical landscape architect for the National Park Service, and an archaeologist for the U.S. Forest Service. A member of the Iowa Tribe of Kansas and Missouri, he is currently the Vice Chair and Tribal Historic Preservation Officer for the Iowa Tribe of Kansas and Missouri, excuse me, Kansas and Nebraska. And now I'm happy to turn it over to Lance to begin the webinar. Thank you. I, uh, I am going to see, make sure that I do this right because uh, I'm using Keynote on this and I need to make sure that I have it working right. All right. There we go. Now, hopefully it doesn't do its own timing, but this is basically for Iowa History 101, Iowa's Native Nations. Um, uh, it's basically taken the first part of this from the book, The Indians of Iowa, Put out by the University of Iowa Press, and uh, and it was a while back. I started writing this in the 90s, actually, when I was at Iowa State, because a lot of people didn't know what tribes were there. There was a lot of confusion about that. So I started doing a, a web back in the first days of the web called uh, Native Nations of Iowa, and eventually I evolved into a book, and it took that long to get it done, and, and that's been a while. But the structure of this talk will be kind of following that book, and I have it here. And the part that I will be reading from will be about Indian history, the section on Indian history. And uh, because this is a seminar in history. Uh, 
We'll see. And then the part two will be about my tribe, the Bakoji. Bakoji is how you say it, like in Indian, uh, like uh, in German, ach is what that sound is. Um, and we'll kind of do a brief overview from pre-contact origins to what's going on in our tribe today, including our regenerative agricultural directions and uh, our new tribal, Iowa Tribal National Park. And then we'll go into questions and discussions. Uh, let's see, first of all, let's cover a little bit about the archeology, span the evidence of the human past in Iowa. This is kind of a, uh, an outline of the time periods there. So ancient hunters over 13,000 years ago, and I put them both as BC as well as BP, which is before the present, which is a difference of 2000 years because some people understand things one way and sometimes the other. And this book, like I said, it's, it's pretty thin because it's meant as kind of a introduction um, the web in particular is really great at giving you detail, but it launches a bunch of stuff at you. It's hard to evaluate it. And it changes all the time. Something you went to see there one time, all of a sudden it's gone. So books still have their place. Secondary is the longest period of history in, uh, in Iowa for native cultures. That's called the archaic period when they had small bands, uh, family extended kin bands rather than tribes as such. And that was almost 8,000 years of a period for that to happen. They evolved into the woodland period when there was the beginnings of tribalization. That's when you started seeing the bow and arrow. That's when people started farming, corn, beans, and squash, things like that. It was, again, a longer time period, but mound building was really a key feature of that time period. Then we move into a late prehistoric period uh, when you had basically people coming from the Mississippi side, uh, sometimes called Mississippian cultures. And then you had people coming from the Plains, Plains villagers. And uh, Iowa seemed to have be kind of a transition zone between those two. The period AD 1650 through 1750 is what they call the proto-historic period. What that is, is there's not necessarily any written material on what happened there, but the fact that there are European trade goods like uh, glass, beads, um, metal, things like that, that uh, were introduced as trade goods um, shows that there was contact going on, even if it was just ripples of trade goods moving across the country. And finally, there's the period now, 1750 to 2020. Um, yeah, hard to believe, huh? Uh, and we call it Indians and white settlers because that's a time period when white settlement really began in the place that uh, eventually became known as the state of Iowa, 270 years ago, uh, roughly. These are all kind of judgmental time periods um, based upon consensus for the most part, but it's a way to kind of orient yourself. So the part I'm gonna to read today, uh, Native Nations of Iowa, history, 1700 to the present time, these are like basically four um, periods that I'm gonna be reading from my book for you. And you'll be able to kind of see where we're at. I, I'll leave this up. So. It's one of the sections, uh, the way the book is arranged, it's by, by the nation, by the tribe. Um, and then in between each section, there are special topics like archeology span or like history. So I'll start reading the history part now. Indian knowledge of historical events dates back many hundreds or possibly thousands of years before the coming of white settlers. Before white settlement, native peoples passed along their history through spoken traditions or oral history. With the coming of white settlers, another dimension to history was added through the written word of explorers, the military, traders, missionaries, and settlers. Soon tribes had individuals themselves who used the written word to record their tribal histories. Before 1700, Native Nations of Iowa. In the centuries before Columbus landed in the West Indies, Iowa was home to many native groups spread throughout the state. These late prehistoric groups classified by archaeologists based upon artifacts like pottery, were known as Great Oasis, Mill Creek, Glenwood, and Oneota. All seem to have been at least partially indigenous to Iowa with woodland culture roots. Some archaeological traits originated in other areas, such as a set of religious concepts from Mississippian cultures downriver. No one knows for sure what these indigenous groups call themselves. Archaeologists associate the Oneota with the Chuere Suin, like the Iowa, Oto, Missouri, and Winnebago, or Ho-Chunk, and the Glenwood with Cadoans like the Pawnee and the Rickroll. 
The great oasis in Mill Creek seemed to have left Iowa, merging with some Central Plains elements to become the Mandan, Hidatsa, and the Rickret in the Dakotas. By the 1300s, Iowa is inhabited only by the ancestors of the Iowa, Oto, and Missouri. Why did they leave? During the 1300s to 1400s, climate changes stressed natural resources, increasing conflict between the various groups. The climate on the plains also became wetter from the 1400s to the 1500s, thus more favorable for agriculture. However, Columbus would land in the West Indies in 1492 and changes were coming. The arrival of Europeans in the Western Hemisphere had an impact upon Iowa people well before white settlers came into the area. European contact with the Eastern Seaboard and Mexico had significant repercussions. Disease undoubtedly entered via the Mississippi River and the Great Lakes, decimating native groups. Survivors were often assimilated into larger tribes. Trade goods like rings and metal began to trickle in. The first contact between whites and Indians in Iowa came in 1673 with the visit of the French explorers Marquette and Joliet to a refugee the village of Illinois Indians near the mouth of the Des Moines River. The Illinois had fled there to avoid the depredations of the Iroquois from the east. The Beaver Wars far to the east caused many tribes to flee westward. In fact, those distant wars were the root cause of the movement into Iowa of the Sauk and Meskwaki from the east and the Sioux or Dakota from the north. 1700 to 1800, Iowa as a refuge from Eastern wars. Conflicts like the French and Indian War, the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, and intertribal wars and intrigues to the East, as well as the westward expansion of American settlers, pushed many tribes west from their original homes in Eastern states into Iowa, beginning in the late 1670s. Thus began a domino effect that resulted in many of the intertribal wars in Iowa during the 1700s. The 1700s and early 1800s were marked by terrible wars among the Sioux, Sauk, Meskwaki, Iowa, and o Omaha for Iowa lands. Although the French and Indian War and the Revolutionary War were fought farther east, they also affected the tribes of Iowa in that tribal alliances with the French, British, or Americans became the basis of intensified intertribal conflicts. In the 1700s, after wars with the French and with other Indian tribes, the Sauk and Meskwaki moved from Michigan and Wisconsin into Iowa and Illinois. Some of the Sioux pressed south into Iowa from Minnesota, where they were in conflict with the Ojibwe. These movements pressed Iowa's smaller residence tribes, notably the Iowa and Oto, further west and south. The Oto left Iowa to settle in Nebraska, near the Pawnee, Iowa stayed in southern Iowa uh, until the 1830s. The Omaha also continued to use western Iowa's less hills. The Ojibwe, Kickapoo, Muscoutin, and Potawatomi occasionally camped in eastern Iowa or raided resident tribes like the Iowa for war tro trophies or slaves to trade to the French. The Comanches and Plains Apaches also raided tribes in Nebraska and Iowa for slaves to trade to the Spanish in New Mexico. The native nations of Iowa began to experience changes in culture also because of the expansion of the fur trade and the exchange of trade goods. For example, Iowa tribes ceased making pottery and stone tools as metal pots and tools became more available through white traders. In the late 1700s, French settlements were established in a few places in eastern Iowa. Julian Dubuque arranged a mine lead with the Meskwaki and Iowa at the mines of Spain. Iowa at the time was under Spanish control. Louis Tesson was awarded the first Spanish land grant in 1799. These early settlements and trade partnerships between Iowa tribes and European adventurers were additionally developed and strengthened through marriages and liaisons. The children of these unions were the earliest mixed bloods. 1800 and 1900, war, treaties, and removal. Throughout the early 1800s, the wars in Iowa among the Sioux, the Sauk and Meskwaki and the Iowa continued. In 1800, Spain transferred land, including Iowa, back to France. Three years later, the United States negotiated the Louisiana Purchase, including Iowa, from France. 
the explorations of newly acquired lands by Lewis and Clark and by Zebulon Pike resulted in the first settlement of Iowa by Anglo-Americans. The War of 1812 caused great intertribal friction as tribes like the Dakota sided with the United States. Others such as the Sauk and Iowa were split between British and Americans. And so others like the Meskwaki tried to remain neutral. After the war, the treaty period began in earnest. Those tribes friendly to Americans were rewarded and the pro-British tribes were penalized. As the US frontier reached Iowa, conflicts such as the Black Hawk War of 1832 provided an opening to coerce the native nations of Iowa into a long series of treaties from 1804 to 1857, ceding Iowa lands to the United States. In addition, the US policy during the 1830s of removal of Indian tribes from homelands east of the Mississippi River meant that many tribes were forcibly evicted to the newly designated Indian country, should be Indian country, Indian territory is a particular term that uh, is used just before statehood. Now, Kansas and Oklahoma. The neutral ground was established in Northeast Iowa and some of the Winnebago were put there as a buffer between the Sauk and Meskwaki on the one side and the Sioux on the other between 1832 and 1846. After ceding traditional lands in Illinois and moving briefly to Missouri, a large band of the Potawatomi settled near Council Bluffs from 1833 to 1847. The Spirit Lake Massacre of 1857 was a tragic incident between one desperate blend of Wachpikute, Santi Sioux, and white squatters. This was just a prologue to the 1862 Dakota Uprising in Minnesota. After that, many Dakota were hanged in Minnesota and others were imprisoned at Davenport for a time. Although tribes put up a spirit of resistance, the native nations of Iowa were almost all moved between 1830 and 1860 onto reservations in Minnesota, Nebraska, the Dakotas, and Kansas. Even so, many returned to visit ancestral grounds and hunt when they could. Some families succeeded in living in small camps for decades longer when white communities were amenable, as in the case of Johnny Green's band of Pottawatomie near Marshalltown, or the Big Bears, a Winnebago family that lived in Northeast Iowa. Of all the native nations, only the Meskwaki understood enough of American ways to return to Iowa in 1856 to purchase a place with their own funds and with the agreement of the Iowa state government. Thus, the Meskwaki settlement Steer, still existing near Tama is not a reservation, but the last remaining free community of any of Iowa's native nations. Some members of the former tribes of Iowa, such as the Iowa and Oto, fought in the Civil War on the side of the North. By the 1890s, only the Meskwaki remained in Iowa as a group, although members of the Yankton, Winnebago, and Omaha tribes continued to live as individuals in Iowa, especially in the area around Sioux City. Some mixed bloods married into white families, with the result that their descendants would know they were indeed part Indian, but would know neither which tribe nor any cultural connection with their native roots. At the time, it was an economic disadvantage and even dangerous to be recognizably Indian. Most McBloods who could pass as white did so, often turning their backs on their Indian relatives in order to do better economically. 1900 to the present, endurance and renewal. The Meskwaki stayed in Iowa on their settlement lands near Tama, preserving their traditions as well as adopting American ways to meet their needs. At the same time, Indians from out of state uh, reservations like the Omaha, the Winnebago, and the Sioux continued to live and work in Iowa communities, such as Sioux City, throughout the 1900s, seeking jobs that were scarce at home on the reservations. Racism and poverty resulted in massive cultural and social damage for these people. Indians from Iowa have served in World War I, World War II, Korean War, the Vietnam War, the war in the Persian Gulf, and the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. Indian veterans remain among the most respected people in their communities. Many know of the Navajo code talkers of World War II. The Meskwaki also served as code talkers in North Africa. Changes in federal policy, such as the Indian Reorganization Act of 1934 and the Self-Determination Act, resulted in Indian communities having more say in their own future, including programs for employment, civil rights, education, and housing. Today, Sioux City, Des Moines, Council Bluffs, Davenport, Iowa City, and Cedar Rapids have substantial urban Indian populations. In addition, 
many of the colleges and universities in Iowa have attracted Indian students from areas all over the United States. The political struggle for Indian rights was evident from several incidents in Iowa. The Omaha and Winnebago fought for reservation lands lost to Iowa through shifts in the channel of the Big Bend of the Missouri River. They won, and subsequently they put the first Indian casinos in Iowa on that land. The 1976 trial of two Indians involved with the American Indian movement, occupation of Wounded Knee, was moved to Cedar Rapids, and they were acquitted. Sioux City has been a focus of the Indian struggle, thanks to a relatively high Indian population and discrimination there in housing and employment. Many Iowans who have native blood from Indian groups throughout the United States have lost contact with their relatives and their roots through historical accident, although in some cases, ancestors rejected their Indian identity. Some may have a relatively high percentage of Indian blood, others much less. They may appear to be white or black, but may self-identify as Indian. For many, a sense of identity is a large question mark in their lives. The contemporary Indians of Iowa continue to make efforts to maintain their cultures and rights. Battles continue over such issues as discrimination in health, Indian gaming, and the protection of burial and archaeological sites. Another issue is the exploitation of Indian tradition through ignorance or fraud, especially through the commercialization of the popular interest in Indian art, traditions, and spirituality. It is important to remember that when it comes to Indian spirituality, one should never pay to pray. All of these issues are ones which generations to come must address with honesty and concern. So that's a reading kind of summarizing the history of Indian people in Iowa in general. So uh, these are some of the native nations of Iowa that are have real significant um, periods of stay, history, events in Iowa. And I would suggest to people anywhere that you need to know the people from your own place. It's good to know about the famous ones from other places, but realize every place in the United States had native people that lived there at one time, originally. In, uh, in Iowa, of course, we had the Iowa. Um, I'll tell you kind of where Iowa got its, its, um, its name because there's a lot of confusion about that. Doesn't mean this is the place or between two rivers or a beautiful land or anything like that. Because they're, they always say it comes from an Indian language. Well, there is no Indian language. Each of these nations had their own languages and some words different from each other as English is from Chinese. So there's no such thing as Indian language. Um, the river Iowa was known as the river of the Iowas because the Iowa lived on it. We lived on the upper Iowa. We lived on the regular Iowa River at various times. And when Albert Lee came through the area to explore as part of the um, expansion, well, territory of Wisconsin um, and then into Minnesota, um, he talked about the Iowa country, uh, which was the River Iowa area and he talked how beautiful it was. Well, uh, that became Iowa territory and then the state of Iowa. So that's the origin was the river, the, the Iowa River, and then uh, which got its name from us. So we were there until we sold our last lands in 1838, our seated. Uh, we kind of saw the writing on the wall. Um, we didn't have the numbers to resist. We had resisted up until the War of 1812, and then our numbers really plummeted. The Meskwaki, of course, they came in as a, a refuge about 1730 or so and are still there. The Sauk, people kind of combine Sac and Fox. Well, Meskwaki are also known as the Fox, of course, historically, and um, they have such a close history and have done various treaties with the United States jointly, and that's why they're known as the Sac and Fox, but they're really two different people. The Sauk were there from about 1760 until 1836. Um, the Omaha and the Ponca, again, at one point were the same people, broke apart um, just before history began and are now in Nebraska. But they were in Iowa prehistorically, and again, like I mentioned with the casino, um, the Big Bend, uh, the Missouri River, the Omaha, um, uh, basically they, there's the... Uh, they and the Ho-Chunk have, have a casino now in Iowa. Um, so they have a long-term connection. The Ho-Chunk also were prehistoric uh, connections. The Iowa were basically a, uh, a division that came off of the Ho-Chunk probably uh, in woodland period times, but finally the finalization of that break 
happened um, just before the 1500s. The Pawnee and Rikra, um, although there were more in Nebraska, they moved up along the Missouri River and, and uh, basically until the 1830s hunted there. Potawatomi were one of the Indian tribes from the east that were removed to Iowa, given a place to settle there for uh, about 13 years before they were moved out of there down south in the Missouri and then here in Kansas and other places. Um, of course, there are various bands of Potawatomi too. The Illinois or Illini uh, Confederacy, ones like the Moinguena and uh, Peoria, um, they were, had been kind of on the refuge moved just like a lot of the Eastern Indians in the 1600s. Um, but by uh, the 1650s into the 1680s, they occupied the Eastern part of Iowa. And uh, about the 1680s, they began to move out. Uh, the height of their, their uh, fortunes were kind of tied to the French um, in the region. And um, then just kind of began to kind of um, decay from there in some ways. The Santee, now that's why I use the, the, the term Sioux, because there really isn't a, a bridge term um, for the Santee and the Hanktawa. Um, they're, they're, in fact, Maria Pearson always referred to as Yankton Sioux, the Santee, Dakota. Um, there's a lot of complexity there, uh, but there really is an umbrella term. So, and, and people, like I said, I wrote this for people who know these terms like Winnebago. They don't call themselves Winnebago. It's Ho-Chunk, we're ho chunk how we call them, um, their relatives. But because it is written for people who aren't familiar with Indian history or Indian words, Indian tribal identities, um, you kind of got to work um, from where people, um, the knowledge base that people have. And of course, there were other visiting tribes at times, like uh, I think the Huron and the uh, Ojibwe and others occasionally camped down into the area of what became Iowa, but it was always on visits. For example, the Iowa, we visited as far as New Mexico and the Rocky Mountains, and we went all the way to Montreal, but we wouldn't consider those homelands. This kind of gives you an idea of the, the loss of land um, that uh, the tribes went through. Uh, if you look at there, you see in 1825, the neutral line was established by the United States between the warring Dakota and Sac and Fox and uh, uh, they spelled that, I see it, X should be a K. Anyway, that they should uh, go ahead and divide that, but it didn't work out. And they ended up making that into a neutral ground that they put the, the Ho-Chunk in there, uh, kind of provide as a buffer, but that didn't work out very well either. Um, the sad thing was with that um, neutral line established, they said, oh, we're not interested in your land. We just want you to stop fighting. So five years later, they began to take take that land. So it was always in the United States plan. I mean, that's that's what we do, right, as the United States. But in 1857, after a lot of land loss, Meskwaki went on their own and returned to Iowa. There are other topics in the book. Um, Indian women in Iowa, um, traditional ways of life, native spirituality, languages and place names, uh, native arts and crafts, Indian houses and the landscape, Spirit Lake Ma Massacre, going to a powwow. A lot of people like to go to powwows and what you're supposed to do and what you're not supposed to do. Um, a lot of people struggle with the idea of, do they have Indian blood? What does that mean? One thing to remember is that uh, whether you have Indian blood or not, that is separate from tribal identities. Tribal identity has a lot of complexity to it, culture and history and biology and everything, but just because you have some blood as a particular tribe doesn't mean you're a member of that tribe. It's a, it's a, a subtle thing that maybe we'll do another, another show on at some point. And then about Indians in Iowa today. Today, like I said, the only really re residential Indians there are the Meskwaki, known as the Sac and Fox of the Mississippi in Iowa. Um, they're at the Meskwaki settlement near Tama, Toledo. And uh, the Ho-Chunk and the Omaha both have their casinos, one near Sloan and one near Onawa. And historic tribes like Iowa, because of federal laws um, with development and with burials and things like that, we continue to be consulted for projects throughout Iowa. And of course, there are people from historic tribes all over, uh, the Dakota, 
I mean, um, I know folks who are Navajo that are there. I know people from, um, um, let's see, there was, uh, I remember a guy from the Southwest. I can't, another guy from the Southwest. I can't remember his tribe. But there are people from all over that live there now. Um, and they go to school. They have jobs there. They, they married people. Their children are there. They're Iowans. And then uh, thinking about all these things, it's probably time for a reboot of the book because there are some things I probably would write a little bit differently, better information I've gotten since then. Um, and there have been changes um, over the last 10, 20 years. So that's one thing. So that's part one. Let's talk a little bit about who the Iowa are. That's my tribe. Who are the Bajo J Iowa? Um, and what does that mean? So um, I'll drop that down a little bit later because I'll talk about what it means. But legends, our legends speak of clans. Clans like the bear and the buffalo and wolf and eagle coming from different places, meeting each other and forming a great nation near Red Banks identif and identified as being on Lake Michigan near Green Bay, Wisconsin. However, the latest evidence, remember that's, uh, that's where we came together. The actual clans themselves came from different places, Effigy Mounds area, throughout Iowa, on the Iowa River, the Des Moines River, origins in woodland societies in Iowa and Wisconsin over a thousand years ago, such as Effigy Mounds. Um, there was a change in the culture about a uh, thousand AD. Um, they lasted to about 1700. That culture as known by the archeologists as Oneota, has a certain particular kind of pottery and other traits that identify them as our ancestors. Uh, there are many locations including the Pipestone Quarry in Minnesota. Uh, we were probably known best as traders of items like copper and uh, pipestone and buffalo hides, along with buffalo scapulas. And the Leary site here in Nebraska, I, I'm talking to you right now from probably about uh, four miles uh, from the Leary site, which is a national historic landmark. And it's an ancestral village of our people from about 1400, well, 1200 to 1400 AD we were trading with the ancestors of the Rick Red Pawnee. Language and traditions, our closest relationship is with the Oto in Missouri and Ho-Chunk. We all broke apart and went our own ways, although we continued to have relationships. Uh, that split was sometime between 1200 and 1500. Now, this is the question people talk about Iowa. Well, you know where, where Iowa came from. Uh, it basically, it was Iowa's on the Iowa River. But it is a term that people, again, discuss. Does it mean the sleepy ones? Does it mean um, the Mer people of the marrow? You hear all these interpretations. Hundreds of years ago, they made the decisions. The best that I could come up with as far as Iowa, it relates to a Sioux word that means to rock back and forth, which is one of the ritual actions that you do when you adopt somebody through the pipe dance. And you uh, rock somebody back and forth all night as an adult who you're adopting into your family, sort of like rocking a baby. So. So th that's where the sleepy ones kind of come from. You're rocking, rocking back and forth, um, which is that motion of the pipe. And then uh, ba koje. So in our language, ba means snow, but ba, you can't hear it's like voiced. One is voiced and one has a kind of a puff to it. Um, one means snow and one means nose. The nose actually means a protuberance, which also can mean head. So. That's why you see ba as head or, or snow or, um, or nose or, or uh, and you combine it with hoje, hoje means ashes. Like uh, it also means the color gray. So you combine those in column A and column B, ba, pa, right? And hoje, that's where you get all these combinations of ash heads, snow heads, um, gray heads, gray snow, all these combinations. And everybody has their favorite. Everybody defines it a certain way. I would say most of our neighbors call us the gray snow people, and that's the one we tend to go with, but there's a lot of background to that. Our first meeting with white people, the French, was in the 1680s, and um, I guess I was gonna have maps at one time. Anyway, so uh, after contact, after the 1680s, we were living throughout Iowa and the surrounding states uh, along the river valleys of the Missouri and the Mississippi and several bands. Our total population about 5,000 um, about at first contact, but basically we had been in decline uh, even before then, um, according to our legends. 
epidemics and intertribal wars with movements south and west along the Missouri River. Basically, we were kind of melting back like snow, receding from those lands in northeast Iowa that was kind of being taken over by some of the wars between the Algonquians being pressed um, by the wars uh, going in the eastern United States and the Dakota um, being pressed again south by the Ojibwe conflict. So we kind of kept moving to the south and west. Um, I think the Sioux, the Dakota were around 25,000 at that time and Algonquin more than that. And the uh, Iowa, like I said, we were 5,000 actually declining from then. Lewis and Clark and others noticed our presence around Council Bluffs, uh, abandoned village, I think they noticed in 1804. And about that time we were on the place called the Iowaville in interior Iowa on the Des Moines River where we lived until through the late 18th, 1700s into the early 1800s. Um, and then we were in southern Iowa, northern Missouri after the War of 1812, when we began a series of treaties ceding lands to the United States uh, from the 1820s through the 1830s. In the removal, which was an act in 1830, for us it moved us in 1836 from our last kind of land holding in our Aboriginal homelands in northwest Missouri around the town of um, St. Joseph to our present reservation in um, in what they called Indian country at that time. Um, but uh, in 1854, um, the Kansas-Nebraska Act drew a line right across our reservation. And that's why we have the really weird name of the Iowa tribe of Kansas and Nebraska. Several forced sessions after 1836 um, basically began to shrink, shrink the reservation to its present size. From about 256,000 acres here to about 12,000 acres by 1861. Uh, almost all the men fought on the side of the North in the Civil War. After that war, due to land pressures uh, from settlers pressing in from different areas and the utter destruction of our game, uh, deer, buffalo, everything, half the tribe moved to Oklahoma uh, in the 1880s. The allotment of land uh, in 1887 to 1892 destroyed um, holding our reservation lands in common. People think about Indians living on a reservation, you just kind of live where you want, not since the Allotment Act. Uh, the actual was destruction of village life, was destruction of our traditions because they wanted to make us into Americans. So you have talked about the Indian problem, right? Back in those days, what are we gonna do with the Indians? Because the United States was expanding, you wanted more land, and uh, you had three choices. One is to kill Indians off, which happened, um, through intention and by epidemics. Um, you could either do that, you could uh, push them before you, like with Indian removal, what it did, or you could absorb them and make them into one of you. That's through intermarriage, through acculturation, um, destruction of our language, destruction of all those things, like through boarding school. Um, at a low point, there were only maybe about 150, 300 of us left. Those of you in small town Iowa, you know, if you come from a town, 150, 100, or 300 people, not a lot of uh, choice in marriage partners. You know, you have, uh, you're related to, to probably most of them. Also, uh, you've got people very old, very young. Uh, so it's kind of hard to find somebody to get married to. That's what happened. And sometimes we married other tribes, but sometimes it was the white farmers in the area that we married. And uh, that's why you probably, some of you are like, wow, you don't look Indian. Well, that's what happened to pretty much all of us. There are no full bloods left. Um, of our tribe. Uh, in 1930s, New Deal changed in um, our fortunes and we formed our own tribal government. Uh, and several pieces of our own reservation land, which we had lost about 90% through the Allotment Act, uh, we were able to buy back a few tracts. And that's what we've been doing when we can ever since. Last from the 1940s uh, during World War II and, and afterwards, there was a scattering of tribal members uh, because there really wasn't enough land here. We'd lost, like I said, about 90% 90 of it and people needed jobs. They needed places to be with their families. And after service in the armed forces, like um, many, some say most did, um, there was chances to get training, electrician, things like that. Um, and so people looked for work in big cities. My grandparents moved from the reservation during World War II to work in the shipyards in California. There was a long period of struggle and slow rebuilding from the 40s to the 70s. And then beginning in the 1970s, after the war on poverty and the civil rights era, there was a lot more federal programs for community housing 
economic development. And so there was a period of growth starting in the 1970s into the 1990s. With the Indian Gaming Act passage, we changed from bingo into a class two gaming and we started Casino White Cloud. We're a very small rural casino. We're not a multi-million dollar casino by any means. We're way out here in the middle of the sticks, um, far from anyone, far from a lot of places. We have to drive 20 miles round trip to go to a grocery store. No, 40 miles round trip, 20 miles each way. Um, and so that can kind of uh, be a issue. Um, and so we did get some of the money from the casino to start trying to uh, recreate roads, uh, build some infrastructure here, and to buy back some more land for our farming practices. Um, we don't do per capita. We don't distribute money among our tribal members, unlike some tribes, and we have very little compared to most tribes, but uh, we do the best we can. And uh, we, our main focus was jobs for our own people. Rural lands were changing more everywhere, as you well know. And as industrial agriculture changed from those smaller family farms, diversified agriculture into big business, um, the damage to our land was becoming noticeable. The water is becoming polluted from all the um, uh, pesticides. Uh, in fact, we have to mix water on our wells to keep under the nitrate level uh, so that people can drink the water and the uh, damage of the land was becoming more and more noticeable. So beginning in the 2010s, we were looking for other avenues. The markets with all the volatility, you know, when you sell, um, everybody knows that for the most part after that change, you had to have a big spread and a lot of land. Um, basically, if you're a small farmer, you died out or it got really hard to kind of operate. The bigger farmers are the ones who became successful. That meant more input, more money. Um, and so that small size, we weren't able to compete and the markets were so volatile, right? And then we began to notice that soil health was really starting to suffer and that um, within 30, 40 years, even with inputs, uh, it would probably be sterile. So we looked in several new directions uh, since about 2016, based on those regenerative farming practices, trying new things. The first thing really was, was honeybees and regenerative cattle grazing, uh, cover crops, range chickens. And, and we're one of four uh, tribes in the, in the country at, it's licensed to start looking at growing hemp um, for CBD, for hempcrete as building material, all those things. We just um, finished our first year at production and we're going to continue to do that. We have to have a different kind of crop because we weren't making any money. We weren't even breaking even on the corn soybeans because we didn't have enough land. So the floods, especially those ones in 2019, uh, basically shut down our casino for eight months. And now the pandemic of 2020, uh, these challenges um, may mean that you have to do some changes and people don't like change. It's hard for people. And the community still, the community still struggles with it. Um, and there's a commitment to these regenerative practices and economic initiatives by our tribe and the leadership that we have now. And it's always a struggle, change. One of the things that um, personally, I, as TIPO, my other job, I got elected in as vice chairman this last fall, just before the pandemic hit. And uh, oh, surprise, surprise, a lot of fun there. Um, but anyway, before that, from 2013, I was the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer, uh, tasked to uh, kind of look, try to protect ancestral sites whenever I could and advocate for them, um, try to advocate for a culture uh, handle Native American Grace Protection Repatriation Act. Um, I'm one of the few who know much of the language anymore. Um, so I had a lot on my plate already. Um, one of our sites here, like I mentioned before, is the Leary Site National Historic Landmark. Um, and it was declared nationally significant in 1965. You have to manage these things a certain way to protect them. On our reservation, the Nature Conservancy owned a place called Rula Bluffs Preserve, which was designated by the state of Nebraska as a biologically unique landscape with several threatened species of animals and plants. And they decided because it was too far for them and the expense, they couldn't really manage it the way they wanted to. Garlic mustard is incredibly invasive. So they decided to transfer it to the tribe in two tracks, the first in 2018 and the second one in 2020. The second track has a lot more stricter requirements, things like no hunting, um, things that people kind of were used to doing here, no uh, motorized traffic, stuff like that. So. I uh, thought that this would be kind of a good idea 
to try to preserve it. So I looked around, I found uh, Frog Bay National, His National Tribal, uh, Tribal National Park up there in Wisconsin uh, was an option. I thought, you know, if we have these places, one cultural and one biological um, to try to preserve and you've got pressures to not preserve it, how do we do that? We don't have taxes. Um, we don't tax our individuals. I mean, we have to pay taxes, federal taxes, uh, like anybody else does, but uh, how do we do that? We don't have any money to do that. So I thought, well, let's try to preserve it as a tribal national park, Iowa tribal national park, and try to begin to try to develop some tourism, try to develop education, and then we can hopefully preserve and advocate for our ancestral sites here. Um, that was my, my objective in doing that. So uh, the executive committee, uh, the vice chair, we've got five people, chair, vice chair, treasurer, secretary, and member. Uh, we passed it by resolution 2020 of July, July 2020. With those two tracks, the total is 564 acres, which is what pushed it uh, above um, Frog Bay Tribal National Park, Park at 180 acres. That's the only reason that we're largest. Now there are other protected tribal sites in the United States. The Navajo have a lot of protected sites. The Ute have a mountain they protect. Uh, some tribes in the Northwest do. But for the name, Tribal National Park, we're the second one established and currently the largest. Doesn't mean somebody's not gonna be bigger than us because I know the Blackfeet have uh, been trying to get that going in Montana. And I think Lakota, we even offered the chance to manage one of the park uh, units up in um, South Dakota, but that just never came to fruition. So we're looking also at expanding other sites significant to us, including the Iowa and Sac and Fox Mission near Highland, Kansas, and the Great Nemaha River Trading Post in Rulo, Nebraska. And the goal really is to tell the tribe's story, which we've lost a lot of, protect our lands, provide jobs and economics, not just for our own people, but for neighboring communities, non-Indian communities, for the betterment of all to, to work together. So here, I'll show you a few pictures. I think we're, I get your time here. Oh, we're coming up on the end of the hour. So um, I want to show you some images. This is Iowa Tribal National Park. If you look here, there's the detail of the Rula Bluffs Preserve um, in the inset there, the purple one, and red, those are the two tracts of land. And then the, on the Leary site, that's the one we had since um, 1965. If you look at the larger map, the larger scale map, that big purple one is was the Nemaha half-breed tract from 1830 to 1860, where the children of Indian mothers and French fathers, American fathers too, were allotted uh, some land and they lost that reservation in 1860. But there's still little pieces like Indian Cave State Park. So we wanna tell the story of that. We wanna tell the story really about not only the French Indian connection and the tribes that were there, but the fact that there are a lot of people with that, that heritage in them. And the uh, ultimate goal of this Great Nemaha River Trading Post, besides selling um, uh, some of our tri tribal products and, and being a supply store for local folks, is to tell that story of the Nemaha half breed tract. And also, um, just what does it mean to be an Indian? You know, there's a lot of people out there trying to figure that out, trying to figure out who they are and their connection. And it'd be good to have a place to begin to do that. So you see our reservations there. Um, that big green area was divided several times. It was diminished several times. The bright green one is what is left of our reservation, the Iowa's, and our neighbor, Sac and Fox, we had a lot of long time alliances there, and that's why it's that way. Uh, this is Rule of Bluffs Preserve. It has a lot of um, interesting uh, resources there. It's kind of a mosaic of woodlands and prairie, uh, endangered species like the Cerulean, Cerulean Warbler. And underneath me, the little windows there, there's an orchid, yellow lady slipper. There's a lot of um, uh, traditional um, medicines there and things that we need to protect. This is the uh, Nimaha China Rechlige. Nimaha is the river. Nimaha River means the river of the river of mud, really, essentially the muddy river. China is a it's village, and Rechlige means ruins or traces, like a campfire. Like you find a campfire, it's kind of left there. So there at the end of the bluff, that area at the end of the hills chain there. That's where that site is. Uh, the Iowa Sac and Fox Mission um, was operational from 1836 to 1863. And it was kind of that first area when we were moved across the river and um, the boarding school experience began and the loss of our language. Ironically, 
there that missionary um, operation is the one that preserved a lot of our earliest language too in uh, verses for the Bible and things like that. Like that. Um, this is an image. Uh, that's what it looks like in that little tiny thing right up there, that little picture up there. That's what it looks like right now. It's kind of an artist uh, rendition of what it would look like with the museum and uh, perhaps a hotel on the top floor and a store on the left. Um, but the museum would be on the bottom or bottom right there to help tell the story there. And also, like I said, Indian identity. I originally had a vision of a museum of Indian identity, but um, you know the money isn't there, so we do what we can do. And that's the end of my uh, kind of presentation. That marker there, that is the boundary marker where they drew the line across our reservation. Uh, one part is Kansas, one part is Nebraska, and right across where you see, that's Missouri. And then Burr Oak is a really amazing Burr Oak tree that we have here. It's a beautiful tree. And that would be my presentation. Thank you, Lance. Uh, we have a few minutes to answer some questions at this time. Before I pose the first question, I want to remind our participants that you can still submit your questions to the Q&A feature. As you know, we're on a tight schedule. Uh, so please note we may or may not be able to get to all the questions before the end of the webinar. But here's the first question, and it's a pretty easy one, I think. Um, and the question from a few people is, can the general public visit the Tribal National Park? At this point, it's not open for, we're gonna to try to phase it in by 2025 is our goal for a general opening. Um, we just don't have any interpretation funds and things like that right now. So we're working in small steps. We have to build it as we have money. And this is another popular question that we received. What is the proper way to give land acknowledgements? Uh, that's a very complicated thing. You know, land acknowledgement kind of started in our traditions when you go to some other tribe's territory you ask for permission to enter uh, and you say what you're going there for and why you're doing that. And they either say, yes, come ahead. And if you want to go ahead without asking permission, then you're at war, you know, basically. Um, somehow that evolved, I'd say, maybe in the 1990s is when, when we were using that kind of thing where we would say we're in Sacre Fox territory, you know, we do presentations. And then somehow it got hold in academia and uh, it became kind of a way to kind of be sensitive or cultural diversity kind of a thing. And, um, and it's a, now we're kind of ambivalent about it because it seems almost sometimes it's just kind of a, a trendy thing to do without understanding this, the spiritual significance under it. And, and so it's, you'll ask most tribal people, we're a little ambivalent about it now, but it's good to know. I always want people to know whatever state you're in, at least the history of, of the people that came there before you. And we do have a question. Um, can you talk about any efforts to regain the Iowa language? Yeah, uh, language is something that most people use as a badge of identity anymore. Um, it's like if you can talk a few Indian words, that makes you like feel better about yourself, which is great. But um, most of the time, people maybe memorize how to introduce yourself or whatever. Language, if it's going to survive, has to be used daily has to be a medium of communication. It has to have a reason for it to actually function as a language. Um, a lot of our languages are sleeping. The Meskwaki still speak their language, uh, but I think even they're facing the uh, uh, you know, challenges because the youth faced by you know, all the internet, it's not in their language and everything. So you know, it's a difficult thing, um, but I at least try to get people to be aware of our language. Uh, that's, that's what I had to do. And you talked about this a little bit in your presentation, but how unique is Meskwaki settlement in Tama for Native Americans in the United States? You know, that's a good question. I don't know really any other tribe at this time. I, there may be some out there, but my awareness, nobody else that I know of has actually gone back to their area of origin, honing up, well, that's how they got the money. They sold horses, some of their horses. They went back from Kansas where it wasn't working out for them, they were sick. And they went back there and they sold horses and they asked permission to buy some of their own land back. And uh, since they had been friendly to the Americans, the, the state actually agreed to it. So I don't know of really any other, but there may be. And this will be our last question, but it's a great way to tie today's presentation into the modern day. Uh, and but, but what are your thoughts about Deborah Holland's nomination to become U.S. Secretary of the Interior? Are there things you hope she might accomplish if confirmed? 
I think um, all the Indian people I know of, different tribes are very excited. You know, Department of Interior oversees BIA, oversees the national parks, it oversees a lot of our resources, it oversees the laws that, that protect our burials. I think people are very excited and very hopeful. And with that answer, this is all the time we have for today's webinar. Uh, I think we can all agree this has been a very informative lunch. I learned a lot. Uh, there are some questions that came in about uh, sources and additional questions. There will be an email sent out uh, later tomorrow with more information. So be on the lookout for that, everyone who joined us today. And also, thank you for joining us. We hope everyone will sign up for the Iowa History 101 webinar on January 28th, our next one in the series. There are many great stories from Iowa's past to tell in the upcoming months. Now, for more information and to register for future webinars in this series, check out our website at iowaculture.gov. This webinar and past presentations are available on our website as well. And while you're there, you can look into some of our other fantastic digital programs, such as our Goldies Kids Club pro program activities, for young historians, or watch video recordings of the Iowa Story Series, which is hosted by our Iowa City branch. Again, thank you all for joining us today and have a great afternoon. We look forward to virtually seeing you all here again on January 28th. Thank you all. Thank you.